remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, happy Sabbath. <laughs> it is indeed a tremendous blessing to be back. Amongst my family, we are family, amen, in Kettle Falls, and I, am I loud? Is it pretty loud? Is the microphone okay? All right. And so, I am here for one purpose, and one purpose only, and that is to magnify the name of Jesus. That's it. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is that Word? Jesus. Now, we don't have to be so formal. You know, I like to dialogue with the congregation. Jesus is the Word. John chapter 14. Thomas asked Jesus a question. Jesus, Jesus replied, I am the way, the truth, and the what? And the life. So Jesus now likens himself to the word and to truth personified. Jesus is truth in a person. Isn't that awesome? Now watch this. Jesus is the word. Jesus is truth. And these two ideas coalesce in John chapter 17, verse 17. The word of God says, sanctify them how? Through thy truth. Jesus, thy word. Jesus again is what? Truth, my only plan, my only mission, my only goal this Sabbath is to uplift Jesus, who is the truth, by his word. Is that okay? All right. And so today what we're going to do, we're going to look at um, a Sabbath canvas. I'm going to share with you what we, my wife and I, what we share with the community and how we give Bible studies on the Sabbath. You know, it's very important that we do teaching. Amen? Isn't that true? And we know that evangelism is the heartbeat of uh, the church. And so the first portion of the message is going to be, uh, I guess, a Bible study, and is going to show the importance of the Sabbath, and especially with emphasis, uh, well, the importance of the Ten Commandments, with special emphasis on the Sabbath. Is that okay? All right. Now, before I get into the message proper, I believe in the health, the health teaching of health. What about you? And um, Jesus, he was very much into health. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, and Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus is healing all kinds of people. He says that he healed every disease and every illness amongst the people. So Jesus was someone who was interested in health. And um, one of the best ways my health nugget today, I'm going to talk quickly about walking. Now, I'm not talking about some sort of stroll or saunter. I mean a brisk walk. You know that walking is good for you. You're aware of that. What does walking do for us? What are some of the benefits? Circulation? Okay. What else? Fresh air? Okay. What was that? Clears the lungs. Well, you know, walking has several benefits to it. Uh, one benefit of walking is you gather, you get more energy. It increases your energy. I don't know how that works. You use energy to increase more. It's kind of interesting. You remember in high school when you were taking biology and you studied that ATP? Somehow walking, a brisk walk, increases your energy. It helps, um, I guess, uh, balance. You, balance is not the right word, but your weight. You know you don't want to be overweight and underweight. Uh, walking helps moderate your weight. Uh, one good thing about walking is this. If you walk at a good steady pace, walking, um, I'm trying to think of a delicate way that I can put this. 
if you walk and exercise, when you go to the restroom, you will have a more enjoyable experience. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that. You can read in between the lines. And so, but walking has many benefits, and the Bible uses the word walk, or it's cognate. Walks, walked, walking. The Bible uses the word walk, or it's cognate, over 300 times. The King James Version. Uh, don't you think that's kind of interesting? Maybe. Just perhaps. God is trying to tell us something. We should be out there walking. My wife and I, we're looking forward today, and tomorrow we're going to be walking. I mean, what a beautiful day to go knocking on doors. I guess I got to say it twice to get an amen. What a beauty. I know it's a scary thing to do. It's a scary thought to knock on doors, but my wife and I, we're planning to knock on doors um, after lunch because of the love of Jesus. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you so much for the cross of Calvary. Thank you for your greatness and your mercies toward us. God, I ask now that as uh, we get into the message, Lord, that you will um, really, you convey the message through me. Dear Lord, and uh, may we leave this place encouraged to do evangelism. May we leave this building encouraged Courage to give Bible studies to our neighbors and co-workers. God, thank you so much for hearing this prayer. It is in Jesus' name. I send it up to you. Uh, send your Holy Spirit. Amen. I was at work two weeks ago. I was working and, you know, every now and then God will uh, put people in your path to talk to. And I'm at work, and I'm talking to two coworkers. And somehow, I brought up the, the subject of uh, um, religion just two weeks ago. And I started talking about the Sabbath. And I gave a three minute, only three minutes, because I'm at work. You know, you're supposed to work, amen. And so just a three minute, real quick, three minute Bible study on the Sabbath. And uh, to, uh, to, to two coworkers at the same time. The gentleman said, he said this. He said, oh, that's kind of interesting. But okay. well, the one lady, she said, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter just as long as you love Jesus. What do you think about that? Does the day matter? Or is it okay if we just love Jesus? Oh, well, you know, if you love Jesus, you're going to keep his commandments anyway. Now, we see that in the second commandment, all right? We love Jesus. Let me ask you a question, church. How important are the Ten Commandments anyway? Oh, they're the character of God? Okay. Now, wouldn't you say that's important? Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the same canvas. When my wife and I, we knocked on several doors. And we've given several Bible studies at the door on the Sabbath, okay? So I'm going to give it to you just like I give it to complete strangers, all right, or co-workers. And so we believe that the, I believe, I believe that the Ten Commandments are important. But if I believe that, is that good enough for me? Is that good enough that I believe it? Uh, no, right? I have to show it from the Bible. Amen. And so what I do, I take the scriptures and uh, I peruse the pages and I let God speak to me in regards to his Decalogue, his Ten Commandments, because I believe they're important. What about you? I'm going to ask you a question. If you had only one opportunity to memorize a passage of scripture or some verses, what would you memorize? What would it be? Some people say John 3.16, for God so loved the world. What other passage of scripture come to your mind, brain? What would you memorize? The Lord is my shepherd, Psalms 23. We have that one down. Anyone else? No. Who? Someone said something? The Lord's Prayer? You know, the Ten, okay, I see John. You know what's fascinating about the Ten Commandments? Because we say that it's important, and it is. If I had only one passage of Scripture that I would memorize, it would be the Ten. Why is that? 
look at how sweet the Bible is. Oh, this thing is amazing. God, uh, who wrote this book? Who wrote this? Men inspired by the Holy Spirit. But note, though, men wrote this. Right? Now, who wrote the ten? Hmm. This is exactly how I give it to the neighbors. Exactly how I give it to the community when I'm talking to total strangers. God wrote the ten. Now, watch this. If God wrote the ten, the next question would be, why? Why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Someone said, who? Happiness? I heard happiness. The Ten Commandments are a guidebook. Why else? I'm more so on the happiness part. Why else did God give us the Ten? Show us his character. Amen. Now watch this. If we would just follow Ten Commandments, it would be like heaven on earth. Think about it. If we follow the Ten Commandments, would we have to lock our doors that night? Oh, commandment number eight says what? Oh, come on now. You're a little slow. Come on. Commandment number eight says what? Commandment number six says what? Oh, come on, come on. Come on, church. What does the sixth commandment say? There you go. Come on. We're Seventh-day Adventists, so we should know this stuff, amen? All right. You know, um, when my wife and I, when we knock on doors, I just really want to encourage you. When we knock on doors, you would be absolutely amazed at how many Christians have no idea what's contained in the Ten Commandments. You'll be shocked at how, and I'm not being mean here, at how biblically illiterate people are. And I'm talking about Christians, not atheists. <laughs> Even uh, people in seminary, we met a young lady in seminary, she didn't even know the Ten Commandments. So please be encouraged to study that thing. So the young lady said that God gave us the Ten Commandments for our happiness. Let's see if that's true, because we don't want anyone's opinion, amen? We want to thus say the word. So turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And let's look at verses 12 and 13. When you get there, say amen. All right. I'll be reading from the King James Version, and, there's, and that's intentional. You'll see why. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. The Word of God puts it this way. If you have the King James Version, uh, you can respond. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to what? Fear the Lord. What does that fear mean? Fear means to respect. Right? To have a healthy fear for God. You know, it's interesting. Um, my mom, she passed away a few years ago. And I, I knew my mom loved me. I had a real good mother. And uh, she, instilled with the, she instilled within me good principles, you know, be a man of honor and things of that nature. And uh, she instilled fear within me. I feared my mom. I, I highly respected my mom. I know my mom loved me. I know that for a fact. My mom died years ago, and I'm still fearful. Why? Because she instilled it within me. I, love, I knew, I know my mom loved me. The Bible says, fear the Lord, love him, respect him. Fear the Lord thy God. To what? Walk. There it is. To walk. To walk in all. Walk is just um, a metaphor for obedience. To walk in all his ways and to love him. Hmm. I wonder how we show our love for God. And to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Verse 13. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for what? For thy good. The Bible actually tells us why God gave us the ten. And that reason is this. For our good. Well, someone may be wondering, 
how do we know that in verses 12 and 13, that the commandments there is talking about the ten? Well, just read it in this context. Look at verse 1. Deuteronomy 10, verse 1. At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone, like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write. Who's doing the writing? Mm -hmm. Not Moses. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hew two tables of stone. Look at verse 4. And he wrote. Who was the he? God. And God wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments. So it's clear that God is talking about the Ten Commandments. I was at work again about a month ago. And uh, one of my co-workers, uh, she mentioned something about church. You know, we should be witnesses. We should be a light at work. Amen? And so she mentioned something about church, and I said, uh, I asked her, so why do you go to church on Sunday, Chris? <laughs> I asked her, I said, in a loving way, so why do you go to church on Sunday? She said, oh, I don't know. Fine. People, you know, and that's okay. That's okay. We're not here to badger anybody. I'm not here to badger anyone. People just don't know. So I said, so what about, I brought up the Sabbath. And I said, isn't it interesting that God himself wrote the Ten Commandments? She said, what do you mean? And I said, Moses did not write the Ten Commandments. She said, really? She was kind of surprised. About, I'm not kidding. About three hours later, she came to me, all excited. She said, hey, I Googled it. Said, yeah, that's what she said. She said, hey, I Googled it, and you were right. God wrote the ten, not Moses. Quick Bible study. Isn't that simple? How easy is that? It's very simple. And so I just find it fascinating. So watch this. So watch this. God writes the ten. Now, now, if you're taking notes, you're going to want to jot these numbers down. Listen. We know that God wrote the ten commandments, and it's evident from the Bible, from these verses, from these chapters, rather. Take these down. Exodus chapter 24. Exodus 31, chapter 32, chapter 34, Deuteronomy chapter 4, 5, 9, and 10. I know it's kind of fast, but those chapters tell you exactly that God wrote the 10. I'm going to repeat again. Exodus chapter 24, Exodus chapters 31, Exodus chapter 32, and Exodus chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Chapter 5, chapter 9, and chapter 10. Those eight chapters in the Bible show clearly without any ambiguity that God himself wrote the 10. So I ask people all the time, I say, if God wrote the 10 commandments, oh, wait, let me put it in perspective. We just established that who wrote this book? No, no, who wrote this book? Men, right? Men inspired? Right, right? Where, where's that text found that they were inspired by the whole way? The reason why I put these things out is because I want us to think, amen? Think these things through. Now watch this. So I ask people, I say, okay, men wrote this book. Let's go to the commandments itself. Turn with the Bibles to Exodus. Turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. I want you to see something. And uh, it's the way that we interact with people and the way we reason with them will win their hearts. Exodus chapter 20, looking at verse 1. And this is how I put things into perspective when I'm knocking on doors. Men, God entrusted man. Let's put a numerical value on it, okay? God entrusted human beings to write how much of the Bible you would say in a percentage. How much would you say? You're with me, so watch this. So that's what I say when I'm knocking on the doors or I'm talking to people at work. I say, God entrusted human beings. We're fallible, amen? God entrusted some 40-plus authors to write 99.99% of Scripture. But when it came to the 10, mm -mm, God said, hands off. I'll take that one myself. In other words, God, when he wrote the Bible, even if we take into consideration Daniel chapter 5, verse 5, you remember that uh, bloodless hand on the wall? Many, many tekel, umparsin. Even if we take that into account, this is how much of scripture God himself wrote. He wrote less than this, less than. God wrote less than 1% of Bible. 
And I ask the people, I say, what do you think about that? My last you, what do you think? It must be super important, amen? If God said human beings, you can have 99.99%, you can do that. But for me, I'll take the 10 on myself. And you know what's fascinating? You remember Moses? What did Moses do with the first set of the Decalogue? The first set of stones. You remember? He did what? He broke them, right? In Deuteronomy chapter 9. And now in Deuteronomy chapter 10, God says he out two more tables and that he will do the writing. Now you would think, now look, look at this line of reasoning. Now, you would think that if Moses broke the first tables of stone that God wrote, that God would say, well, Moses, you broke the first set, I'll let you write the second set. Is that what God did? Oh, no. Mm -mm. God didn't tell Moses, I'll give you a stab at it. You go ahead. You write it out. Uh-uh. God himself wrote the ten, including the fourth. For what purpose? Mm -hmm. And where is that found? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Now listen to this. If God gave us commandments for our good, can you give me or can you think of a story where God himself gave a command for someone's good? Can you think of a story? For the good? It's not a trick question. God gave verbally a command for someone's good to keep them out of um, harm's way or to prevent that person from something terrible happening to them. There you go. My dear elder, he says Adam and Eve. He says, Adam, now, I can't take your word for it, can I? But I can look in the Bible, amen? I believe you're there. I'm going to verify your words. I just want to make sure. So let's go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, beginning, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. Are you there? Verse 16 and 17. Look at verse 16. And the Lord God, what? Commanded. Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Listen, the very first recorded words in the Bible from God to man was a command. Now, now watch this, watch this. We don't, know the very, we don't know if God said something else to Adam. We don't know if God said, Adam, come look at these beautiful flowers that I have created. Adam, um, look at these awesome animals that I have created to dwell with you. We don't know if God said those words to him before declaring this. But the first recorded words from God to man was commandment. Why? Because the God that we serve, the God of this book, is a God of law and love. Or you can put it um, differently, love and law. And you're going to see it right in these texts. Look at verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Where's the love? Come on, in verse 16, where's the love? Every tree, right? God, is, you know, love is an action word. Love gives. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. So God, being loving, gave every tree to Adam except one. Why? Love gives. Look at verse 17. Every tree you may, um, thou mayest freely eat. Verse 17. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely what? Die. So was it in his best interest, was it in his best interest to keep the commandment? Why? For his own good. So you are absolutely right. Right there. For the good of man, God gave us the ten. Look at this. Look at verse 17 again. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Now those three words, thou shalt not. Do those words ring a bell? God has given human beings command. Now, where do we see that formula? Thou shalt not. Where? Ten Commandments. Commandment number one, what is it? Oh, I hear it like it's like a mixed multitude. I really want you all to think. Commandment number one is what? Thou shalt have. Thou shalt not. You see exactly what God told Adam. Thou shalt not. Commandment number one, thou shalt not 
Have any other gods before me? Commandment number two. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness. Commandment number three. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Commandment number five. Commandment number five. Honor thy father and thy mother. Commandment number six. Thou shalt not. Commandment number seven. Thou shalt not. Commandment number eight. Thou shalt not what? Still, you got it. Oh, okay, awesome. Commandment number nine. Thou shalt not what? Bear false witness. In other words, don't lie. Commandment number 10. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's what? House. What do you say? Anything. Yeah, that's how it ends up. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. But the formula is clear. Thou shalt what? Not. And it began in Genesis chapter 2 before sin. God gave command. How important is this? Oh, it's super important. Now, with that in mind, let us hone in on the Sabbath. Friends, I was looking. I was watching a preacher on YouTube. And he's a Sunday keeper. Look, I don't have anything against Sunday keepers. A lot of them just don't know. Amen? Come on, I'm not here to judge anybody. How can a sinner judge another sinner? That doesn't even make sense. Watch this. So I'm looking, listening to this preacher. Goes to church on Sunday. And his title of his sermon was this. The fourth commandment is the only commandment that Christians feel okay with violating. It's the only one. Isn't that? Just think about it. Think about it. The commandment is the only, the fourth commandment is the only commandment that you can break and still look holy. You have to think about it. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Can you have gods and still look holy as a Christian? No, no. Commandment number eight. What is commandment number eight? Still. Can you still and still look holy as a Christian? Oh, no, no. Commandment number five. Parents, if your child slapped you in your head and told you to shut your mouth, would that be nice? Why? Because it contradicts commandment number what? Five, right? You cannot do those, you cannot break those commandments and still look like a Christian. But when it comes to the Sabbath, you can break it all week long and still look holy. The only commandment that Christians feel okay to violate. Well, we have to look at this commandment. So I believe if God wrote it himself, it must be very important. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. This is making sense so far. This is kind of easy. Can you do this? You think you can do this? Give this canvas? This is simple. I, I'm, this is intentional. I want it to be easy. Let me tell you something. I've told so many people about the Sabbath, and you will be amazed at how the light bulbs go off. My wife and I, we were in... A uh, sole pro proprietor, a uh, small business owner in Colville, we gave her a, like a 20-minute Bible study in her business, in her establishment on the Sabbath day. Remember, babe? We gave a 20-minute Bible study on the Sabbath day. You know what she said? She said, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to have to study that out. And look, this is simple, real simple. The same thing I'm sharing with you is what I shared with her. Look at this. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. Notice, notice how specific God is. He says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not, there it is again, thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy uh, maidservant, nor thy cattle. Man, God even gave rest to the animals. What kind of God is that? It's awesome. Nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Did you get it? No, no. Did you catch the awesomeness of the Sabbath? Look at how awesome God is. Watch this. 
How many commandments did God write with his hands? His finger. How many? He wrote ten. How many of those commandments have the idea of holiness? Explicitly have the idea of holiness. The only one. Now watch this. Let's read the commandment again, commandment number four, closely. Look at the first verse, verse eight. What does it say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Oh, wait a minute. This is the only commandment that uses that word for holiness or sanctified, set apart. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now that's how the commandment begins. How does it end? Look at the end. Verse 11. You did what? How does it end? Hollowed it. What's the word? What does uh, hollowed mean? Watch this. The beginning. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days he looked and he hollowed it. The word hollowed and holy are the same exact word in Hebrew. Same words. In other words, watch this. God bookended the Sabbath with holiness. The only commandment that's holy. Now, isn't that fascinating? What does holy mean? What is the holy? What is that? Yeah, it means set apart. Is, for a purpose? All right. Let me ask you a question. Is God holy? Now, now, come on now. Is God holy? Because the fourth commandment is the only one that starts with holiness and ends in holiness. Oh, you can't make this stuff up. Amen? This stuff is beautiful and sweet. And so, Isaiah chapter 6. We're not going to turn there. But you remember in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw he was on the throne, someone on the throne, right? God on the throne, the Lord on the throne. And you remember he saw angels, these angelic beings. And one, they had six wings. You remember this? And with one wing, they would cover their faces. You remember, they veiled their faces. And what would they say? Holy. Holy, holy. You know those three words, holy? The same exact Hebrew word for holy in the fourth commandment. Hmm? What about Revelation chapter 4? You only see it three, only two times in the entire Bible. Once in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 says holy, holy, holy. Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 says the same thing. Remember he's given a vision, a heavenly vision. And the heavenly beings in verse 8 of Revelation chapter 4, they say... Holy, holy, holy. And it's a reference to who? God. The true and living God. So just as God is holy in Isaiah chapter 6, just as God is holy in Revelation chapter 4, we see that same holiness in the fourth commandment. Not in the other commandment, only in the fourth. You know, it's interesting. People will say, I've, I've had this. I was in Orlando. Um, years ago, and I was talking to some of my coworkers about the Sabbath, more than one person. And, you know, sometimes when you talk about these things, when you don't see eye, and eye, eye to eye with an individual, um, it can become kind of contentious. Isn't that true? You can kind of combative. And so we're going back and forth, going back and forth. And a young girl says, she said, why do you Adventists make such a big deal about the Sabbath? He said that to my face. Think about that. Now, if someone said to you, why do you make such a big deal about the Sabbath? What would you say? Wait a minute. What do you say, dear sister? Oh, here's what I say, here's what I say. I say, I cannot make a big deal about the Sabbath because I did not invent the Sabbath. So it's not mine to make a big deal. On the contrary, Adventists don't make a big deal about the Sabbath, but God does. <laughs> Let us say, where is that in the Bible? Show me that in the Bible. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Go back to Genesis. We don't have time. Let, let the Bible speak. It's very important that you let the Bible speak. Genesis. When I knock on doors, I make, I make it clear to the person that I'm going to let the Bible interpret itself. We're very intentional, right? Oh, yeah, well, I'll tell them. Very important. All right. So Genesis chapter 2, let's see how important the Bible is. What a big deal it is for God. 
Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were what? Finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the what day? On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the what day? On the seventh day, from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the... I don't know how people miss it. I don't know how they miss it. Just this past week, I was listening to a world-famous preacher. And he said that the Sabbath is not morally binding. Oh, my God. How did they miss it? He's a very convincing preacher, so I will, I will not um, give his name. But he said, oh, it's not moral. And he read this text. Look at verse 3. Let's keep reading. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Oh, big deal, preacher. I don't see the Sabbath there. There's no mention of Sabbath there. Here's what I say. Listen, I've used this text. I was in school in Orlando. I don't know where all these stories keep coming up in my head. I was in school in Orlando, right? And I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness. I've used this text. If you want, just remember it this way. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, this is what I call it. It's the text that keeps on giving. It just doesn't stop. I mean, it's just so amazing. It's hard, difficult to refute. So I talked to this um, Jehovah's Witness, and I showed them, I did this twice. I showed her this text. I said, what do you think about that? Because Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll use the King James Version also. So I said, what do you think about that? Oh, I don't know. It's interesting. I was talking to uh, um, a Latter-day Saint in the neighborhood in Colville there. We gave him about a 20-minute Bible study on the Sabbath. You know what he, his response was? He said, and he's been Mormon for over 20 years. He said, you're right. Saturday is the Sabbath. That's what, exactly what he told us. How do you refute this stuff? Look at it. Look at verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. Watch this. Did you see it? Did you see it? Right here. This is pre-sin, not post. God rested, he blessed, and sanctified it. Now, isn't that the same thing it says in the fourth commandment? In, in that same exact order, he rested, he blessed, sanctified it, or made it holy. Watch this. This is interesting. So God, it says he sanctified the day, right, in Genesis chapter 2. Guess what the word sanctified here is in Hebrew? This is a, it's set apart, yeah. It's the same exact Hebrew word found in the fourth commandment, the beginning and the end. It's the same exact Hebrew word found. When those angels, holy, 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 Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, this word sanctified in Genesis chapter 2, the same exact word. And this is fascinating. This word for sanctified, set apart in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it only appears in the entire book of Genesis only one time. Now, you, not, not, and it's connected to the Sabbath. Now, isn't that amazing? The word sanctified or holy, as thick as Genesis, I believe, has 50 chapters. It only appears one time in connection with the Sabbath. Fascinating. Look, look, I want the Sabbath because God blessed the day. The day is blessed. Not only that, but the day is set apart. The day is holy. God blessed it, sanctified it, set it apart. And you can hear the people. Oh, because you'll come across some objections. Oh, you haven't. Will you just leave the Sabbath alone? Stop making such a big deal about the Sabbath. Just love Jesus and it'll be all right. Mm-mm, doesn't work that way. It's not a big deal. Who is an Adventist anyway? Who's an Adventist? You know, you know why I keep the Sabbath? You, you know why? Let, let me ask this question first. You know why I keep the Sabbath? God says, absolutely. Why else? Because, yeah, amen, because I love God. Why else? Jesus. The word of God is so sweet. You know how people say that Seventh-day Adventists were a cult? You know? If someone comes to me and says that I'm a cult because I believe in so-and-so, you have a prophet, uh, you, all, you all worship Ellen White, you believe in this and if someone comes up to me with that kind of foolishness, I just tell them, so what and who cares? You call me a cult, so what and who cares? They said that Jesus was in league with Beelzebub, remember? 
Yeah, you cast out demons by the prince of the devils, Beelzebub. Jesus, he hung out with wine, burbers, and drunkards. You remember that? They said Jesus was in league with Satan. So, hey, if someone says they're Adventists, well, you know, we're a cult, that's okay. You're in good company. Same thing they said about Jesus. I let them talk. Listen, let me tell you what an Adventist is. Let me tell you. An Adventist is someone who models their life after Jesus. Come on. An Adventist is someone who patterns the life of Christ. Yes, the reason why we go to church on Sabbath is because Jesus went to church on Sabbath. Take these texts down. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Mark chapter 6, verse 2. Luke chapter 4, 15 and 16. And Luke chapter 6, verse 6. Those four passages of scripture, those four texts, make it crystal clear that Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath teaching. So watch this. Jesus taught Adventists teach. Jesus went to church on the Sabbath day in synagogue. Adventists go to church on the Sabbath day. Why? Because we model Jesus. Jesus, did Jesus eat pig? No, no. Jesus did not eat pork or pig. Adventists don't eat pig. Jesus did not eat lobster, crab, or shrimp. Adventists don't eat lobster, crab, or shrimp. Why? Because we model our lives after Jesus. He's the one that we follow. Oh, Adventists follow Ellen White. Please. I don't follow Ellen White. Probably because I don't follow Paul or Peter or Moses either. I don't follow them. I follow their writings about who? Who do they write about? They wrote about Jesus. How can I follow a sinner? They needed Jesus just like me. The only person that I, as a Seventh-day Adventist, follow is Jesus. Mm-mm, none of them stretched out their arms. Well, on Calvary's cross for me, it's all Jesus. Jesus kept the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath. He's in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I'm in church on the Sabbath day. You know what people will say, though? No, no, no. You're a sneaky preacher. This is what they'll say. Stop being sneaky. <laughs> For real. They'll say that I'm being sneaky because I'm telling them, showing them from the Bible, that Jesus went to church or synagogue on the Sabbath day. And here's their reasoning. They say, oh, you're sneaky because... This is before Calvary. This is before the cross. This is before the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we all know that at the cross, he says, it is finished. And so was the Sabbath. And we all know that when he died and rose on his early Sunday morning, he instituted Sunday as a day of worship. This is what they'll say. They say, see, preacher, you're being sneaky. Am I being sneaky? Because, see, they say, yeah, Jesus went to church. I'm telling you what you're going to hear at the door. Jesus went to church on the Sabbath day because he was being a good Jew. He was Jewish. That's why he went to synagogue on the Sabbath. So, of course, there's no big deal. After the death, burial, resurrection, he instituted Christianity. No more Sabbath. Oh, now, wait a minute now. If the Sabbath was given only to the Jews, you hear this all the time. You'll, you'll read it in the dictionary, the encyclopedia, that a Sabbath is for the Jews. you read it anywhere. you hear it on you, YouTube. Now watch this. Let's reason this thing out. If the Sabbath was given to the Jews, that means that marriage is only for the Jews. Come on. Let's reason this thing out, y'all. God gave two institutions before sin entered the world. And was there a Jew? Only Adam and Eve. God gave marriage, and God gave the Sabbath. So if someone says to you that a Sabbath is a Jewish institution, it's only for the Jews, what are you going to tell them? Well, you got to say marriage is only for the Jews also. Isn't this easy? That is simple. So watch this. this, is, this we're going to end it up right now. Almost done. So I'm going to give you the canvas. I showed you how important, or I showed you why God gave us the Ten Commandments. According to Deuteronomy chapter what? 10, four hour good. I showed you how important the fourth commandment is. Okay? It starts off with holiness, ends in holiness. I showed you that. I showed you Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, holy, holy, holy. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, holy, holy, holy. And we know that God's character is summed up in the Ten Commandments, is it not? It must be especially in commandment number four. Look at this. 
Now I'm going to do my canvas. I'll show you how we knock on doors. Knock, knock, knock. And so my wife and I, when we knock on the door, we usually we sing a song every single time. We sing a song because you know what music does. Uh, you remember well, who was the king, the first king of Israel? Hey, yeah, yeah, Saul, Saul, Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. You remember what happened to Saul? Remember he had that evil spirit? And who um, played music on the harp? David. And so my wife and I, we sing songs, and it kind of breaks down barriers as well. And so we sing songs, and so just follow the canvas. Just, just do um, what I do, and you will be successful. You will be convincing, and you can't convict, because that's the um, job of the Holy Spirit, amen? But you will, you can convince. Knock on doors. Hello? My name is so-and-so. Uh, this is my wife. We're here. And uh, we want to sing you a song. We want to present to you a gift in music. Is, is that okay? Nine times out of ten, they say, sure. So we sing our, our theme song is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's beautiful because a lot of the times, the people at the door, they'll sing along with us. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. So watch this. So we do that. We, we, we start talking. And when I find out that the person is the Christian, that's when and only then that I bring up the Sabbath. Now, you know, we, we meet atheists and those who don't believe in God at all. Am I going to bring up the Sabbath in those cases? Absolutely not. I'm going to talk about Jesus and salvation, grace, all right? And so we knock on the door, and I get into my Sabbath canvas. And this is what I do. I say, who wrote this? Remember that? <laughs> who wrote this? All right, I'm talking to the person at the door. And inevitably, this is what they'll say. They say, oh, God wrote it. And so I ask again. I say, who wrote this book? And then they'll get it. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, men, men wrote the book that were inspired by God. All right? And I say, isn't it interesting that we have one textbook and so many different denominations? So I say to them, and it works. I say, ma'am, sir, how is it that we have one text with so many different denominations? This is what they'll say. They say, oh, I've thought about that before. I don't know why. So I go further. I say, um, what do you think about the Ten Commandments? Well, they'll, if, they'll say, oh, if they're Christian, they'll say, oh, yeah, it's important. Um, who wrote the Ten Commandments? Oh, Moses wrote the Ten Commandments. Are you sure? Uh, yeah, yeah, Moses wrote the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses. And I show them. I share with them the same text that I share with you. I say, according to the Bible, According to Exodus chapter 24, chapter 31, chapter 32, chapter 34, Deuteronomy chapters 4, 5, 9, and 10, according to those eight chapters, it says that God himself wrote the 10. And they're like, oh, oh, I never knew that. We were talking to um, someone just, just down the street, a young lady, and um, we were giving her, we knocked on her door and she invited us into her home. And then she proceeded to tell us that her husband has, had passed away recently. I so, like, oh, no, I'm not going to give the canvas here. But so she, she, we were talking, and she said that she is so busy. We invited her for Bible studies, whatever. And then she says that she's so busy that she doesn't have time. And listen to what she said. She said, oh, how I wish God would give me a day off. <laughs> hey, hey, it was then and there I knew. That was the opening wedge to give the Sabbath canvas. So listen to what I say. We were talking about the Sabbath, and she speaks Spanish. And so we mentioned Sabado and all this stuff. And she said, oh, that is so interesting. I never knew that. People just don't know. You're not going door to door necessarily to get baptisms. We haven't baptized a single soul. You're just sowing seeds. That's it. Don't worry about bringing conviction. You can't do that anyway. He said, sow the seed. The word of God. Who wrote it? God wrote it himself. You know, there are essentially two objections that we get from door to door. Two objections that come up often, time and time again. People will say, and the reason why I share this with you is so you know what you're going to, you know, come across. And so people will say, well, I understand what you're saying. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I appreciate it. But the calendar has been changed. Oh, yeah, that's what they say. The calendar has been changed. Now, now, when people say that, what do you say? What's your response? It's true. Okay. Yep. What else? 
Okay, why would you follow Sunday? Has it been changed to something different? What, what do you say? The number's been changed? Uh-oh, not the day. Here's what I say. You know, you want to be real. You really want to meet the people where they are and to make it make logical sense. So watch this. I say the calendar has been changed. I was talking to a Mormon about this just a few weeks ago. We were talking to a Mormon right down the street. She said the calendar was changed. I said, really? I said, um, if you go to the calendar on your fridge, you will see that the first day of the week is Sunday and the seventh day of the week is Saturday, Sabbath. I say, um, do you have a cell phone? I say, if you look in your cell phone at the calendar, whether it's an iPhone, look at iPhone. The calendar in your phone will say, the Sunday's the first day of the week, Saturday's the seventh day of the week. If you look at your Samsung cell phone, same deal. If you go to Merriam-Webster Dictionary and you, you type in the word Saturday, it'll tell you the seventh day of the week. Encyclopedia Britannica will tell you the same thing. Now here's the deal. How is it the iPhone, Samsung, the calendar on your fridge, Merriam-Webster and Encyclopedia Britannica, they all say that Saturday is the seventh day of the week. There is no change. How is it that they know, but you haven't gotten the memo yet? Now, I wouldn't say that. I'm not, don't say that part. That might come across. Now, I don't say that. I don't say the last part. But I'm thinking of, you know, how is it that all these <laughs> sources say clearly that the seventh day of the week is Saturday? There is. This is the same thing we told the lady in Colville. I told her, I said the same, and she's like, oh, that's very interesting. The second objection that we get often is, every day is a Sabbath. You've heard this one, right? Oh, I worship every day is a Sabbath for me. And, they, and you know, they usually say it piously, with an, with an air of, you know, holiness. Well, you know, every day is a Sabbath for me. Never work? No, never work. I never thought about that, but that's interesting. Very interesting. I'm going to use that. Oh, yeah, I'll use that. <laughs> hey, we're here to learn from one another, amen? amen? So, yeah, what do you say when they say every day is a Sabbath for me? What do you say? Mm -hmm. That's what the brother said. He said, yeah, every day, this is what I say. I say every day may be a Sabbath for you but it's not for God. And, and this, I'll follow it up like this. I say, you know why every day can be a Sabbath for us? Because God says, he's explicit, the seventh day is the Sabbath. See, the reason why we keep any day we want is because we don't care about anything. We as humans, we kill one another. You saw what just happened to foolishness? You can't even go to a parade. Kill one another, we don't care. We as human beings, we commit adultery all day long. Well, let me not say we. I don't want to put myself in there. But you know what I'm saying. We as human beings, do you know that the average human lies twice a day? That means some people lie more than others. <laughs> twice a day. We don't care about anything. And you think we're going to care about a day? And this is why I tell them out the door. That they don't say anything else. Because it, you see the logic there? It just makes sense. And so... You know, with all that, with all that, people, that's all, that's pretty much all we share with them. Super short, because people don't want you out their door all day, amen? Super short, convincing, to the point, and you can be confident in this, amen? To the point, and the people, yeah, yeah, listen, yeah, 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 you're right, they'll say you're right. Uh, but people, though, some people object anyhow. You know how we find all kind of ways to object? Oh, but preacher, you're in the Old Testament. I said, oh, really? Now, you remember in Luke chapter um, the end of Luke chapter 23, the last verse, you remember what happened? The cross that happened? You remember that the women had to go away? Because the what was drawing nigh? The Sabbath was drawing nigh. Amen. Oh, the Sabbath is still there. That was after the cross. This is clear. And some people say, oh, 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 well, well, well that was after the cross, but that, you know, that's the Gospels. I'm not into the Gospels. I'm into Paul, Peter and Paul's ministry. That's what I'm into. And in the book of Acts, there is no Sabbath. Really? Well, you look at Acts chapter 13, the Sabbath is mentioned at least four times. When you go to Acts chapter 17, verse 2, it says that it was Paul's manner. Come on, y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Acts chapter 17, verse 2 says that it was Paul's manner to be in church, Sabbath day. 
That word manner and custom, you remember in Luke chapter 4, 16, it says it was Jesus' custom to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath? It's the same exact word in Greek. Custom and manner. Paul was just doing what Jesus did, amen? That's why I go to church. Acts chapter 18, verse 4. Turn there, I want to show you something interesting. Acts chapter 18, verse 4. I'm almost done, I promise. Acts chapter 18, verse 4. Let me show you how, how much the enemy hates this. He hates this doctrine. Acts chapter 18, verse 4. Are you there? Acts chapter 18, verse 4. Let's read. The word says this. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So he's reasoning now. Paul's reasoning on the Sabbath day. I was listening to a world-famous preacher years ago. I'll never forget this. It says that, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And what this preacher said was this. He was persuading the Jews and the Greeks that the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Uh, it's amazing that these preachers have these worldwide ministries. Where is that in the text? Well, people say, oh, wait a minute, preacher, wait a minute. That, that's Peter and Paul's ministry. I'm a revelationist. And in the book of Revelation, John says that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and we all know that the Lord's day is Sunday. This is what people will say. They're a revelationist. What is that? <laughs> you know what I say? I don't say anything. I let the Bible speak. What does Matthew chapter 12, verse 8 say? Matthew chapter 12, verse 8. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. Luke chapter 6, verse 5. What do they say? It says that Jesus, Jesus says that he is the Lord. Look at on Matthew 12, verse 8. What does it say? Come on. Matthew 12, verse 8. This is important. You got to let the Bible speak to people. You don't want, you don't want your opinion. Come on, friends. Matthew 12, verse 8. Whoa, who? The Son of Man is the Lord of what? The Sabbath what? Day. So when, so when the apostle, uh, the revelationist, John, said that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, according to scripture, what is the Lord's day? Isn't this easy? But people will go on. Isn't this just amazing how many tricks and how many ploys people come up with to get rid of the Sabbath? People say, oh, not the resurrection. Jesus hadn't been on the cross yet. That's Peter and Paul's ministry. I'm a revelationist. People will go so far to say I'm an Augustinian. Oh, yeah. You know who Augustine was? Watch this. Augustine was the one who was responsible for taking out, for removing the second commandment and splitting the tenth commandment in two. You remember the Catholic doctrine? Augustine did that. He's the one responsible for taking, you know, the second commandment says what? Thou shalt not make unto the graven images, right? Augustine took that commandment out, and he kind of, splitting the tenth commandment is kind of simple. Because it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. And then it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. See what he did there? <laughs> Some people say, oh, Augustine didn't do that. Please. This is where I bring out the old catechism. This is it here, church. The catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, this is analogous. This is to the Catholic Church. What well, the 28 fundamental beliefs is to the Adventist church. This is the one, this, this is so highly esteemed by the church that is promulgated by Pope John uh, Paul II. And we all know how much he was loved. And you read these pages and it's crystal clear. They will tell you, they will actually, actually show you the commandment in this book, how it's changed. Someone thought to change time and law. Mm, don't have time though for that one. Someone thought it up. <laughs> Oh, I tell you, folks, even though it's so clear, did you know that there are people, there are essentially, I'm, I'm done now, I'm wrapping it up, I promise you. There are essentially three individuals here, perhaps, right now. Three sets of individuals in this building right now, perhaps. The one individual says, oh, man, preacher, it was clear. It's clear in the scripture. Oh, yeah, the Sabbath. You showed me from the Bible that the seventh day is the Sabbath. Oh, that's crystal clear. Oh, I get it. I'm going to start keeping the Sabbath. That's one person. Then there's another person that says, oh, I don't know. Not so fast, preacher. Not so fast. 
I hear what you're saying. It makes sense. But I'm going to study it a little more. That's good, amen. That's good. Study that thing. That's good. Don't listen to these preachers. Don't listen to me. Study it for yourself. This is how we get into trouble when we listen to people. Why would you listen to me? Study the Bible for yourself. But there's a third. There's a third individual that says, nope, it's not going to be me. My great-grandmother was an inter-denomination um, field. My, my, my great-grandfather was a so-and-so. Their church was good enough for them. Sunday worship was good enough for them, and it'll be good enough for me. I was listening to a preacher uh, a few days ago, uh, a few weeks ago, actually. He says, I was born a so-and-so. I'm going to die a so-and-so. Can't convince me. Well, I kind of agree with that. You know, I'm born at Venice, born and bred. You remember I told you. I'm born at Venice, born and bred, and when I die, I'll be Adventist dead. Mm -hmm. And so I agree. <laughs> right, so, so watch this, watch this. So there's some folks, they say, Oh, I'm going to stay this way. No change. I'm going to stick with Sunday. No change for me. God knows. God understands. Does God understand? Oh, is God going to let you escape? If you know, these are the ones who know the truth. They've been convicted that Sabbath is Saturday, and they still rebel. Is God going to accept that? Absolutely not, but they believe that he will. And I'm going to illustrate it this way. Tell me if this makes sense, okay? Listen to this illustration. And you tell me if this makes sense. I'm an attorney. What am I? I'm an attorney, okay? And I have a defendant, okay? I have a defendant that is guilty. He has been caught arrested for robbing banks. For doing what? Which commandment did he break? No, the sixth commandment is thou shalt not kill. If you're a bank robber, which commandment do you break? Eighth commandment, right? Thou shalt not steal. Commandment number eight. So I am the lawyer, I'm the attorney, and I'm defending a bank robber. So I get in court, I'm before the, before the judge. And the judge says to me, as the attorney, you know how they talk, that legal speech. The judge says, counsel, how does your client plead? And here I go. I say, your honor. My client pleads guilty on all charges of bank robbery. It is true, Your Honor, that there has been malfeasance played out on the part of my client, but, Your Honor, you must understand that he grew up in a long line, a long tradition of bank robbers. Your Honor, his great-grandfather robbed banks. His very own grandmother in her old advanced age with a walking cane in one hand and a trembling pistol in the other took him on his first heist at the age of eight. So, Your Honor, you must understand he never had a chance. Your Honor, I feel that you will absolve my client of all said transgression. Why? Because you are loving and you are kind and you are full of grace. Furthermore, Your Honor, on behalf of my client, I petition the court that he be granted unconditional, automatic pardon for future infractions of the law, and that that pardon be given throughout perpetuity. You see, Your Honor, you must understand that my client has expressed to me that he will continue breaking the fourth commandment and keep going to church on Sunday. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Your Honor. I've gotten my cases mixed up. Now, I need pardon. Oh. I'm sorry, Your Honor. You have to understand that my client has expressed to me that he will keep breaking the law and keep breaking the Eighth Commandment and robbing banks. Matter of fact, Your Honor, my client, he is scheduled to rob a bank this Sunday and then the following Sunday after that and then the Sunday after that, Your Honor. And we feel, my son, we feel that you will not hold him guilty. Your Honor, we believe that you will turn the other cheek, even giving amnesty to my client. And here is why. Because you, Your Honor, are loving, and you are kind, and you are full of grace. And with those words, I rest my case. Now, come on. Does that 
make sense to you. <laughs> it's such a silly illustration. Listen, yes, the judge is loving, he is kind, he is full of grace, but in no way will he pardon the guilty. He's also just. Oh, you're not going to escape. Because you're your forebears kept signing. Oh no, you know the truth. You are not going to escape. What's he going to do to you? What kind of attorney would I be? You know what happened to me? I'd lose my license. I'd be disbarred for foolishness. And I'd be sent straight to the crazy house. My client, he's going to be locked up and sent straight to the big house. I mean, come on. That's sort of negative. But I'm going to end positive, Amen. You know, the Bible ends in a positive note. Where are we at the end of the scripture? Revelation 21 and 22. Where are we? We're in glory. Amen. The new earth. Heaven. Glory. We're there. I was at um, work, and um, I was walking. I was at work, and I was just walking. I'm minding my business. I'm finding, you know, going to my next patient's room. I work in a nursing home. And one of my coworkers, he said, hey, hey, hey. He stopped me. He said, um, oh, you're a Christian, right? I said, yes. I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. And so we started talking and dialoguing. And he expressed to me that he was a Christian as well. So I said, oh, the first thing that came in my mind, Sabbath time. First thing, if you have Jesus, you believe him for salvation. You don't keep the Sabbath. You get on the Sabbath, amen? First thing came to my mind, oh, I got to bring out the Sabbath somehow. So we were talking a little bit. And um, he said to me, you're a Christian? He was asking me questions. And I was answering his questions. And um, I came up, uh, I brought up the Sabbath somehow. I don't remember how I brought it up, but it came up. Intentional. I brought it up, and uh, he said, it's interesting. I gave him the same little canvas that I gave you here. He said, you know what, that's, that's kind of interesting. He said, um, hmm, talking about the Sabbath. So we finished the conversation. He came to me the very next day. He said, hey, um, I went home, and I went on YouTube. I said, oh. Anytime you get someone a Bible study and they say they go to YouTube, the next day, sometimes it's not good. Listen to what he said. He said, I went home, I went on YouTube, to dis his exact words, to dispute what you said. Talking about the Sabbath. He said, he said this, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. <laughs> He told me, he said, I couldn't do it. I said, really? Okay. And then he says, his exact words, how is it that more people don't know this? You know why. But we're just not telling it. As we should. How is it that more people don't know this? I said, man, that's a good question. So... Two weeks go by, about two weeks go by, and he's all excited. He comes up to me. I'm minding my business. He comes up to me, hey, Kevin, Kevin. He said, hey, two weeks later, he said, hey, I am now a Sabbath keeper. <laughs> I said, really? Oh, wow, that's amazing. He said, oh, yeah. And he started breaking it down to me. He said, oh, yeah. Now, now, I have sundown Friday. This is sundown Saturday. Saturday is my Sabbath. I don't work anymore on Friday nights. I'm now keeping the Sabbath. He said, hey, I'm a Sabbath keeper, and you converted me. I said, really? I, we know that, you know, the Holy Spirit does the converting, amen? Our part is only to spread the message, sow the seed. That's it. Isn't that, isn't that hard? What I shared with you this morning, this afternoon. Is it doable? Pretty simple canvas, Amen. And you can convince others, lead them to Jesus. I thank God for his word, and I trust and pray that you all were blessed. Turn in your hymnals to number... 388, hymn number 388, Don't Forget the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. 